Move, prisoner, was shouted at you. You stared up at the 186 stairs. Then looking at the 110 block of stone you had to carry up them. You were exhausted, weak with hunger and extreme pain. This wasn't the first block you carried up these stairs. And it probably wouldn't be your last. Move, bellowed again. You gathered what strength you had. Lifting the block, you fall in line with the others to ascend the stairs. You heave, drag and lift. Then from ahead, there's a thud, followed by another thud and another. You look up to a boulder, knocking each man down like skittles. The boulder is heading for you. Closing your eyes, you wait for your turn. The suffering was about to end. This was Mauthausen concentration camp, along with its stairs of death. And this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. 1938, August 9th, prisoners of the Dachau concentration camp were sent to Mauthausen, Austria, to start building a new slave labor camp. The site was near a granite quarry and at first was controlled by the German state, but was found funded by a private company as an economic business. So the owner of the quarry, called Weiner Graben, was a DEST company. The company was led by Oswald Pohl, who was a high-ranking official of the SS. The company would rent the quarries from Vienna in 1938. The same year, construction began of Mauthausen Camp, and a year later the company would build the first sub-camp, Gusen. The granite mine was being used to pave streets in Vienna. The Nazis did want an overhaul of major Germany turns and needed a large amount of granite to do this. The money for the Mauthausen camp construction would come from the Dresdner Bank, S. Bank, and what was called the Reinhardt Fund, which was money stolen from the prisoners at concentration camps and the German Red Cross. At first, Mauthausen was a camp for criminal prostitutes and others. But in May 1939, it changed to a labour camp used mainly to hold political prisoners. So the three Goosen camps held most of the prisoners within the complex and it exceeded the number of prisoners at the main camp, Madhausen. Now the DEST started buying land at St. Gorgon, Goosen in the May of 1938. In 1938 and 1939, prisoners in Mauthausen camp were marched to the granite quarries at St. Gurgen. They were more productive than Weiner Graben, so they were more important to the DEST. By the time Germany invaded Poland, September 1939, the Mauthausen camp, still unfinished, was already overcrowded with prisoners. In late 1938, there was nearly 1,100 prisoners and just a year on, it would be over 3,000. So after they invaded Poland, a new camp for the Poles began in Gusen, December 1939, from an order by the SS. This new camp would be called Gusen 1, and was up and running by May 1940. April 17, 1940, the first two huts would hold the first prisoners, while others from camps in Dachau and Sachsenhausen would arrive on May 25th. Mauthausen and Gusen would lease out prisoners to local businesses as slave labour to make more money. October 1941, huts would be separated from the Gusen sub camp and this became a prisoner of war labour camp. This camp held many prisoners of war, which were mainly Soviet. So in 1942, Mauthausen and Gusen were at max capacity, so Gusen was expanded to include a central depot of the SS. Here is where they would sort through seized items from occupied territories. These items would then be dispatched to Germany. The Wehrmacht was an armed force of the Nazi, and they drafted Austrians. Because of this draft, there was less people to take on work locally, so local quarries and businesses were in constant need of labourers. March 1944, this depot was made into a sub-camp called Goosen II. It held nearly 17,000 prisoners, 
who were withheld from the most basic of facilities. December 1944, Goosen III would open. No matter how many sub camps were created, it couldn't keep up with the number of prisoners coming in, which led to overcrowding in Mauthausen and its sub camps. From 1940 to 1944, prisoners went from two a bed to four a bed. At first, Goosen and Mauthausen camps served the local quarries, but 1942 onwards, they started to also serve the German war machine. By the war's end, there was 101 camps with 41 subcamps. Within the subcamps were several categories such as factory workers, construction, cleaning rubble, and a small one where prisoners worked for the SS. Production output of Mauthausen and its subcamps was huge, exceeding in production and money, making even more than Auschwitz. Mauthausen also had a long waiting list for slave labour. The list included national corporations and small local businesses. Some parts of the quarry even were machine pistol assembly plants. In 1943, underground production for the Steyr Daimler Push was built in Goosen. 45 big companies would use Mauthausen and its subcamps to generate huge profit making it the most profitable of all the concentration camps. Taking 11 million Reichsmark in 1944, which just FYI is over 80 million euros today. The companies that used slaves from Mauthausen included DESC, Accumulatorine Fabric, they made batteries for the U boats, Bayer, who made medicine, Eisenwerk Oberdon, who were the largest World War II steel suppliers, Nyblungen Work the largest tank factory, Rack's work, they made V2 rockets, and Hochtiff, who made the tunnels in the Loyboyle Pass. These were just to name a few. Prisoners were rented out for all reasons. Money was money. They worked on farms, roads, buildings, and the banks of the Deube, built residential areas, and were forced to excavate archaeologist sites. So when the Allies started to bomb German war industries above ground, German planners moved production underground so they could be, couldn't be seen or hit. Goosen won prisoners built several tunnels under the hills surrounding the camp. By World War II end, prisoners dug nearly 30,000 square metres to hold a small factory. January 1944, other tunnels were built under the village Skankert Gorgon by the prisoners of Goosen II. They dug 50,000 square meters to facilitate the building of fighter bombers and V2 rockets. They also made war materials. By the end of 1944, 11,000 prisoners in Goosen I and Goosen II were working in the underground fa factories. 6,500 more prisoners would continue expanding these tunnels. By 1945, the fighter bombers Mi-262 were finished, and this allowed the Nazis to assemble 1,250 planes a month. This was the second largest plant, fa plane factory in Germany. Until 1942, the camp was used to hold and kill Nazi political enemies, and those against them. Whether they were or weren't, they were killed. The camp would also help with the German war machines and would use labour as a form of extermination. Prisoners were worked to exhaustion, 12 hours a day in the quarry, becoming too weak and too ill. They were taken to Reaver, which was the, technically a medical facility, although those who managed it had pretty, no, pretty much no medical training. If they weren't sent here, they were sent for extermin extermination. When the camp started, it had no gas chambers. So when a prisoner became too sick to work because of exhaustion, dehydration and maltreatment, they were sent to other camps to be killed. But by 1940, with overcrowding, it was becoming a money pit transferring out the weak to be killed. So Mauthausen became one of a few camps in the West to have a mobile gas chamber. 
A van with an exhaust pipe connected to the inside, and it went between Mauthausen and Kusum. It would kill 120 prisoners at a time when it was up and running. Up until 1940, the Count's prisoners were German, Austrian, Czech, socialists, communists, homosexuals, anarchists, and people of Roman origin. Sectarians was another group in the camp because of religious groups. They were known as Jehovah Witnesses today. They were imprisoned for rejecting loyalty to Hitler and refusing to take part in war service. But after 1940, Polish people would be the dominant group in the camps. The Polish there were artists, scientists, boy scouts, teachers and professors. Camp Gusen II would be nicknamed by the Germans as the extermination camp for the Poles. As the war went on, more wanted would arrive. Educated people and so-called political prisoners would make up the largest group of inmates until the end of the war. Large groups of Spanish Republicans would be sent to the camp. Most were former Republican soldiers or activists who fled to France after Franco Bamonde won. They would be captured by the Germans after France was defeated in 1940. Early in 1941, almost all Polish and Spanish were sent from Mauthausen to Gusen. Some were kept to work in the quarry. Soviet-German war would break out in 1941, sending a lot of Soviet prisoners of war to the camps. They were kept separately from others in huts. They were also where the majority to be gassed at the first group in the newly built gas chambers in 1942. In 1944, Hungarian and Dutch Jews would be sent to the camps, nearly 8,000 of them. Most would die because of hard labor. April 1941, Nazis invaded Yugoslavia. Those suspected of any resistance were sent to Mauthausen camp. Most came from German-occupied Slovenia and Serbia. During the war, prisoners would be sent daily to Mauthausen and its subcamps most coming from other concentration camps. Before arriving to Mauthausen, they were held at detention sites at Dachau and Auschwitz. The first Auschwitz transfer began in February 1942. Aldrich Ekman, one of the major Holocaust organizers, would visit Mauthausen in May 1944. They would then receive 8,000 Hungarian Jews from Auschwitz. This group was the first to be evacuated from Eisrich before Soviet advances. At first there were skilled workers who were evacuated from Eisrich to Mauthausen, strengthening their industry, but as evacuation ramped up, all sorts were sent to Mauthausen and Gusen. As time went on, Eisrich would stop accepting new prisoners, so the new ones were directed to Mauthausen. 10,000 prisoners were evacuated in January 1945. This was the last to be evacuated before the Soviet liberation of Auschwitz. This group consisted of civilians arrested during the Warsaw Uprising. By the time the camp was liberated, only 500 were still alive. During the final months of World War II, nearly 24,000 prisoners arrived at Mauthausen complex. Many of them would die from exhaustion on the march to the camp, known as the Death Marches. Or they died in the, rail, in the railway wagons, where they were held in freezing condition for days before getting to the camps. During these transports, they would go without food and water. Prisoners were also less important than other services, so they were usually kept on the rails to allow other trains to pass. If you survived the journey, you often died before registration. If you were registered, you would be given a camp number of the deceased prisoners. At the camp, there was, no, it was a hierarchy even within the prisoners. So depending on your assignment ca category would decide the treatment you got. Capos were the prisoners that were recruited to be policed amongst their fellow prisoners. They were given more food and better pay and camp coupons. 
which they could exchange for cigarettes. They also got separate rooms inside the barracks. In June 1941, Himmler would order a brothel for Mauthausen and Gussen won camps. The Kapos would be part of the prominent, which were prisoners given much better treatment than others. Mauthausen camp complex was mainly a labour camp, so it was mostly men. But in September 1944, a women's camp opened with the first female prisoners coming from Auschwitz. More and more would come, along with children from other camps. With female prisoners came female guards, 20 served in Mauthausen, 60 in total in the complex. Chief female overseer at Mauthausen were Margaret Fenberger and Jane Bernard. From September to November 1944, most of these female overseers were Austrian. Allegedly, Hildegard Latchett, the female guard who was sentenced after the war for 27 years because of her brutal treatment of inmates, served at Mauthausen. Statistics of the prisoners from Mauthausen in 1943 showed 18,655 prisoners. From this, 2,400 of them were under 18. By 1945, it jumped to 78,547, with 15,048 being under 18. The reason for the increase in children was down to taking teenagers from Poland, Czech and Soviet, using them as slave labourers during the war. A total of 14,891 children were in the camp just before liberation. Mauthausen wasn't the only concentration camp to exterminate through labour, but it was the most brutal and horrific. The conditions were really bad, even by concentration camp standards. The prisoners suffered from malnutrition, overcrowding, abuse, beatings and hard labour. With so many prisoners at Mauthausen, they couldn't all work at the quarry, there wasn't enough room. So many went to work in workshops or manual labour, while the others for their crimes went to the quarry. Reasons to be sent to the quarry depended on the punishment details, often very silly and as little as not saluting a German passing by. This would get you sent to the quarry. Quarry work wasn't pretty. Very, very hot or freezing cold, minus 30 degrees which both contributed to high death rates. Food rations were mouse portions, with the average weight of an inmate being 40 kilograms, which is an average weight of a 12-year-old today. Rations would dip year and year. By 1945, a prisoner would get less than 1,000 calories a day. This reduction led to salvation of thousands. The quarry was at the base of a horrific 186 deep stairs of death. Prisoners had to work all day and then carry a lump of rock. This lump of rock often weighed 50 kilograms. Remember some prisoners were only 40, so they had to carry an item heavier than the them up 186 steps, one behind one, like a mass queue. Exhaustion and weakness all would become too much for some and the prisoners would collapse, falling backwards into the prisoner behind, causing a domino effect the whole way down. This didn't just happen, it wasn't just an accident. The SS guards would force the overworked prisoners to race to the top carrying the block. Surviving this wasn't the end of the torture. At the top they were lined up at the cliff's edge known as parachutist wall guns pointed at each prisoner, they had to choose to be shot or push the prisoner in front of them off the cliff. Others would be beaten to death by the SS guards or the capos. They would be left to starve, they were hung or killed in the mass shooting. Reasons for extermination including sickness, weakness, trying to escape or means of collective responsibility. Sometimes, because they felt like it, the guards or the capos threw prisoners onto the electric barbed wire fences, 
or tucked them outside the camp and shot them, claiming they were trying to escape. Then there was the icy showers extermination, where prisoners died of hypothermia after being forced to take an ice cold shower and then were left outside to freeze. 3,000 prisoners died this way. A lot more were killed by the draining them in barrels of water at Goosen too. From Auschwitz, we know experiments were done on prisoners, and Mauthausen also did them. Albert Heim, the madman and Dr. Det, would spend just seven weeks at Goosen, but would carry out his experiments here too. A Dr. Sigbit Ramsor would declare 2,000 prisoners mentally unfit, and he murdered them with fentanyl. After the war, survivors would report 62 ways of murdering people at Goosen 1 and Mauthausen. The average life expectancy of a prisoner from 1940 to 1942 at Goosen was just six months, falling to three months by 1945. Because of the short life expectancy causing issues with the need for labour, some prisoners' lives improved. Those skilled in special areas were limited to beatings by the SS and Capos. The sick or the weak were still exterminated, but from early 1943, factory workers who were Polish or French could receive parcels of food from their families. This would help them avoid starvation and even save the lives of others who had no relatives at all would be shared. September 1944. 47 Dutch and British Special Operation Executive Agents were captured by the Germans. They went to Mauthausen and were executed by the SS. January 1945, 13 US Office of Strategic Agents were also killed by the SS. February 1945, the camp would have what was called a hare hunt, but hares weren't being hunted. Around 500 escaped prisoners, most were Soviet. They were hunted down, tortured and murdered by the SS, local law enforcement and even civilians. So the Germans destroyed all the camp files. New prisoners were handed the numbers of the dead. So the exact death toll at Mauthausen is still literally impossible to know. It is also gets confusing because some were killed at Goosen from Mauthausen and some killed at Mauthausen from Goosen. A further 3,500 were sent to Hartim Castle, more likely to be killed, but this is unknown. Many others were killed in mobile gas chambers which had no accurate records. Before their escape in 1945, the SS tried to destroy evidence letting only 40,000 to be identified. After the war, a Polish survivor had the archives of the main chancellor. They passed it on to Auschwitz Museum. Gustin won camp, a Polish prisoner got parts of a death register. He took them to Australia. They would be given to the International Red Cross International Tracing Service in 1969. The survivor archives showed 37,411 were murdered, along with 22,092 Polish, 5,024 Spanish, 2,843 Soviets, 7,452 others. A total of 38,120 Jews all died at Mauthausen. The exact total death toll is unknown but is believed to be between 122,000 to 320,000. In addition to this, once liberated, another 1,042 prisoners died in American field hospitals. Only about 80,000 survived the camp complex. In the final months before the liberation, Commander Franz C. Rice would prepare for a Soviet attack. The prisoners were made build a line of granite anti-tank obstacles. Unable to keep their strength from this overloading work, large groups were exterminated to make room for stronger prisoners. 
Because of this, prisoners began to fear mass extermination by the SS, so they began to plan how to defend it if this happens. Himmler would send orders to exterminate all prisoners at Gusen 1 and Gusen 2 to prevent Allies using them. The plan was to rush all the prisoners into the tunnels of the underground factories and then blow up the entrances. But the Polish resistance knew of this, so what they did was take tools with them every time they went into the tunnels to dig air vents in the entrances. So April 28th, a fictional air raid alarm sounded. 22,000 prisoners at Gusen were rushed into the tunnels. But after several hours in this tunnel, all 22,000 were taken back to camp. No reason why, but it was thought to be because of the Polish prisoners cutting the fuse wires. With the plan abandoned, fear was in the air that the SS would try again. So the Polish, Soviet and French decided to make a plan to hit the SS barracks, seizing arms to fight back. Spanish prisoners had a similar plan. May 3rd, the SS prepared for evacuation. Next day, the guards at Mauthausen were replaced with the unnamed, unarmed Volksam soldiers. The police officers in charge of this accepted the inmate self-government. Martin Gurkin, top capos in the Gusen, became the new commander. He tried to create an international prisoner committee, but he wasn't trusted. He would be often accused to have cooperated with the SS, so the plan failed. The work at the sub camps completely stopped. Instead, the inmates focused on defending against a possible SS assault and preparing for liberation. Might house and camp and its sub camp would be assaulted by the prisoners, but it held they held strong and they won. Of all my house and sub camps, only Gusson 3 was evacuated. Before this, on May 1st, prisoners were sent on a death march to Skank Gorgon. But they were ordered back hours later. It was done again the next day, but again it was abandoned. On the third day, the SS guards vanished, leaving the prisoners to their own doing. May 5th, 1945, US Army soldiers approached Mauthausen. They disarmed the policemen and left the camp. Most SS had left before liberation, but 30 remained. They were outnumbered and killed by the prisoners. This also happened at Gusen too. May 6th, all remaining subcamps of Mauthausen fell. At first, it would be the Soviets to use it as barracks for the Red, Cro Red Army. In 1946 to 1947, the camp was unguarded. Items were taken by the Red Army or locals. Summer 1947, the tunnels were blown up. Soviet forces withdrew, turning the camp over to the Austrian police. In 1949, Mauthausen was named a National Memorial Site. May 3rd, 1975, the Mauthausen Museum was open. The site remains largely intact, but Gusen 1 and Gusen 3 now have residential areas built on it. A memorial to Mauthausen stands amongst the others in Pierre Lassine Cemetery in Paris. Nothing can undo such horrors such terrible evil acts, but from it we learn, and in the elegant words of such a young Anne Frank, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Thanks for listening. Next time I'll be covering the Dare to be Different Aviator Amelia Earhart. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.